each week is slowly going to add up and that's just going to train me. So I have that confidence from preparation. When I get in a sticky situation, the ball is up in the sky, the lights are shining, 50,000 people screaming, million on TV, all that blanks out. And I just go back to catching the ball. Um, when I was planning this podcast, I'm like, you know, who can I have on the podcast that exemplifies the execution, grid, perseverance, and who's been there, who walks the walk, talks the talk? And the only name that came to my mind was was Courtney Stevens. So excited to have you on the podcast to share your journey and experiences with the uh, with the listeners, man. Hey, man, it's an absolute pleasure. Um, when I heard when I heard that this is what you were up to, I was excited and I couldn't wait to get involved. So I appreciate the invite. Courtney and I go way back. I think in grade seven, we started playing football together, the Brampton Bulldogs. And, you know, long story short, Courtney uh, you know, went to the, uh, I think, um, uh, CIS, Canadian football, and then NCAA, and drafted by the Ticats at the eighth overall, if I'm not mistaken. And yeah. uh, spent a lot of time uh, in Hamilton and then Calgary. And now I hear you're back in Hamilton, signed again with the Ticats. Yep. So, so you know. if we actually do end up playing football this year, I'll be back where it all started. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Remember we were at, uh, we went to the recruiting trips together. Yes. Uh, at Master together. So, you know, small world, right? Oh, totally, man. I remember actually um, one of my fondest memories of recruiting and whatnot was uh, we went out to this camp in the summer right before, I think it was right before our last year of high school. And we we're both doing really well. And the coaches were saying, yeah, you guys should come back and do recruiting visit and stay over the weekend. And at that point in time, I didn't even realize that, you know, when you're good at football, they want you to come and stay the weekend. And I wasn't really that kind of uh, outgoing personality yet. So I'm yeah, like, yeah. I don't, I don't want to stay the weekend with a bunch of people I don't know. But <laughs> that, that was my first taste of uh, the recruiting process. And learning how the, the schools try to pull the best athletes in, in the different directions. So, yeah. yeah. And, you know, it's, it's crazy, right? Like, I mean, the, when you look at how schools kind of pull the best athletes, um, I, th I think what we didn't realize at that point was that some of the coaches saw potential in some great athletes such as yourself. I think it's one thing to be talented, but the, another thing I think that people saw in you, and I remember this because, you know, I've spoken to coaches afterwards is, the work ethic and what goes on behind the scenes, right? So, um, I, you know, again, I think it goes back to the determination and the, and the effort you put into building such a successful career that now you're seeing back paying the dividends of all the hard work you put in and in high school. Man, you know what? The crazy thing is while you're doing it, um, you don't realize that you're coming to certain forks in the road. But when you look back, you can see decisions that you made here or there along the path that were defining in a lot of ways that shaped the outcomes that you actually uh, reached. So, you know, whether it was high school to university, university to pro, and for that matter, each year of being a pro, trying to stay a pro, people aren't just looking at, you know, what did you do today? They're looking at what led up to you having the opportunity to even perform today. Um, and then, who are you consistently over time because of like the habits that you have and the person you are really dictates, you know, the outcomes that you have in life. It's not, it's not just one great performance that makes anybody a star athlete or a, a great business person or a good parent. It's, it's the constant, um, the persistent things that you do every day um, that, that really define what you get in life. Exactly. You know, I think that's a great um, segment for you. Maybe dive into that a little deeper because I know a lot of the folks listening to this podcast are either, um, you know, in a career in the, in the younger, uh, younger in their careers trying to make it big uh, or are just entering, um, you know, the workforce. And again, everything is becoming technology, everything's going digital. But I think a lot of people are shy that if you do not know about a subject or about technology, you know, it might be something that they cannot do or enter, you know, and what you touched on is all the stuff leading up to a point. If you can dive deeper into that and, you know, how can someone who's looking to build a career in something that looks daunting or a mountain, you know, what are those things that you look back now that you did and somebody else can do 
to achieve that mountain, which really isn't that high once you start getting after it. You know, one of the things that um, I learned as I got older was that uh, business owners and, uh, you know, corporate leaders, they love athletes because of the certain character traits or competitive athletes because of certain traits that they bring to the table, right? And for me, one of the things that I learned early on was that, um, you know, my goal was I want to play on a big stage, big lights, you know, 50,000, 100,000 crowds, like big big events, I wanted to be on the show, right? So in order for me to get to a point where that was something that was a possibility, right? Or even a probability because of the work that I put in, one of the main things I did was seek out mentors, right? And and go to people who actually had accomplished that or get within arm's reach or have a conversation with people who made it to that pinnacle. Even if I wasn't directly talking to them, I was listening to their words through books, through videos, um, just studying the people who were at or had been to the level I wanted to get to so that I could start to model those behaviors and the things that they were doing to to reach where I was trying to go. Um, I find a lot of my friends who didn't make it, who were doing really well uh, at the point that we were all started at when we were in high school and even before then, those were the people who got caught up, um, you know, looking at the pond they were already in, saying, I'm the best here where I am now, or I'm using these skills here now to the fullest of my capacity, and that's doing great for me. Whereas the people who excelled, it wasn't that they were just innately more talented. Of course, they had certain skills, but those were the people who looked at, you know, I'm doing good now, but this isn't where I want to stay forever. So what are the people at the next level doing that I should start to look into? You know, just broadening your exposure to certain ideas and certain approaches to doing your work and certain resources that are available to you. Um, getting the exposure to how the people at the next level or in your next phase that you're transitioning to, how are they operating? And then try to mimic those things because you know it, it does no good to be a straight A student in grade nine math class if eventually you wanna be a MBA, right? There's gonna yeah. be another level. So start thinking like that post-grad, start thinking like, that, you know, um, that intern, before you even get the internship, before you even get the job, before you graduate, start thinking like a graduate and get around people who've already walked down that path that you're starting. That was one of the things that really helped me. And I think I try to carry that um, even yeah. still now, even still now. Yeah. I, um, I speak to a lot, of, a lot of professionals, even businesses, right? And it's so, it's so crazy that this concept of look where you want to go, start mimicking those behaviors now, even before you're there, is the exact same in professional uh, sports as it is in business or career. Because let me tell you this, digital disruption, which is every, everything becoming digital, especially with COVID, everybody's trying to become digital because the normal way is not normal anymore. And if you're trying to survive, you're trying to get a career in the future or businesses are trying to survive, you almost need to start thinking, what is that new normal now? How would you have to do today to get there uh, in two years from now or three years from now? The businesses or people that say, you know what, I've got, I'm, I'm great, I've got a high paying job, you know, we're making money today. I think that is a recipe for disaster. That's exactly what I think you meant when you said people uh, that didn't make it is because they were happy mm -hmm. with what they had at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's looking ahead two, three, four years from now, I mean, one thing I always tell people is like, if you want to get promoted, uh, look at the job description of your manager. What, is it, what are the skills that that person is doing or that job requires? Where are your gaps? It's not hard. It's not rocket science. The basics of looking at what are the gaps between you and the next level and work your ass off to close the gap, right? Simple. Man, I had a mentor. I was very lucky to... Uh have opportunities that I did. You know, I worked my ass off to get them, but the fact that they actually uh, materialized, that's something I'm very grateful for. So I played football, like you said, in Canada, Wilfrid Laurier University. I also had opportunity to spend three years at Northern Illinois University. So two different alumni bases that I was in touch with. And while I was at Northern Illinois, one of our uh, biggest boosters, his name was Dennis Barcima. All right, his name is on the business building. Um, he had a leadership council and would bring together some of the senior members of the team. And one of the main points, 
you know, people tell you a lot of different things. You get a slew of advice over the years. One of the main things that stuck with me, um, this guy, this guy had three companies that he took to um, eight figure valuations by the time he hit 50. Okay. And he told me he wanted to be a CEO before he hit 55 years old. That was his goal as um, a university student. So what he did was he found people who were CEOs. He looked at their CV and he noticed what the experience was exactly what you were saying. So he knew he had to get experience with sales. He knew he yeah. had to get experience doing business internationally. He knew he yeah. had to get business in technology and in human resources and on all the different business functions so that he could speak to individuals um, within his whole organization from a place of empathy and actually know what he's talking about instead of just theory, but having the practical experience. So what he did was he picked up jobs all along his career path that would give him the tools in his tool belt so that when he did have an opportunity to step into that, that C-suite role, he had everything already. He was building up to that, that mountain peak from way before it was ever an opportunity. And that's exactly what you're saying. I think you hit on two great points. Number, the first point is to get to somewhere, you have to do different things that might not be in a vertical path, right? Mm. A lot of people today think of success as this straight line, right? Let me tell you this, and you know this more than anybody else because of you know how ups and downs in CFL, and, and it's crazy. For you to get from here to there, it's like, you know, up, up, down, back, five steps back, and sometimes you want to quit, right? Mm -hmm. And you got to go around, do the things that nobody else wants to do, the things that you mm -hmm. don't like, so that one day it allows you to build a foundation mm -hmm. to get to the level you want to get to, exactly what you said as a CEO role, right? Absolutely. If you don't have the right foundation built, you won't be able to recognize your opportunities when they present themselves. You won't have the, you won't have the stripes on your sleeve to be able to step up for that opportunity. Opportunities present themselves to people who are prepared. So yeah. that preparation, um, the transition that you're going to go through, if you want that transition to happen one day, sooner or later, you better start preparing for it right now. Even if, even if you're just starting out in college, you gotta start preparing for graduation right mm -hmm. now. Building the network, building the skill set, and just exposing yourself to the ideas of, yeah. of people There's who are where you wanna uh, be. There's this quote, and you remind me, it's like, uh, and I'm sure you heard it too on the football field, it's like, success is preparation plus execution, mm. right? People want success, but you got to start preparing behind the scenes, right? Um, the teams that do well, the teams that win championships, prepare mm. when nobody's watching, which in this context, whether it's for sports, school, a career, being a CEO, is doing the things when nobody's watching you. The second thing, it was very interesting that you, that you mentioned, Courtney, was for the CEO story that you, you talked about, all of the skills that he had to gain were not hard skills. What I mean by that is it wasn't anything super technical that required a four-year degree. It was mm -hmm. empathy, culture, sales, communication, mm -hmm. right? So I think it goes without saying that whether you're an athlete or you're trying to build your career, it's not, it's not the technical nitty gritty stuff that's going to help you grow. It's, it's the small things that are basics that mm -hmm. most people don't spend the time on, such mm -hmm. as, you know, following up on time, making sure you're empathetic, making sure that you say thank you to people, um, working hard and, you know, all the things that are for, for free versus yes. learning how to do Python coding, right? Which, is important but it's not going to get you to the top and you know what's another thing too is that um one thing i found that carried over from my my athletic um upbringing into my crossover into you know entrepreneurship and into corporate world is that certain things that you had to initially give a lot of effort to like for example following up with somebody or um being on time or just managing your schedule, like the smallest of things, even just um, having a thirst to know more about 
a topic that you're going to have to speak to somebody about, right? If I came to you and I asked you, hey, I'm, I'm really trying to get into an operations role. I see that you've had experience um, running operations or tech department or whatever it may be. Coming to that conversation with prior knowledge, right? Just so you pay the person a respect um, for the time that they're giving you. So these little habits of doing those small things you do them so much over time that eventually they become your second nature, exactly. right? So now when you get into a room with somebody, it's, you feel unprepared if you didn't do a little bit of research about them before you have that conversation. If you set a meeting with somebody, you feel almost anxious if you don't show up early, right? Or if you send an email to somebody um, after you, you, you had a meeting with them, that's just like your second nature. That's your default. Right, because you practiced it so long along the way so that now once you actually do get to a point where, okay, now I am in a management role. Now I am actually having a job interview. Now I am actually doing these things. Your, your default behaviors are going to be ones that are, are success habits and not negative habits. Exactly. I think you are then able to spend time on things that matter mm -hmm. versus things that take up a little time. The little tactics, like you're people. saying. Anyone can learn tactics, right? But it's in ingraining good behavior, successful behaviors that separates people who just show up and people who stay for the long run. Yeah, I mean, I can't tell you, you know, in my career, so many times somebody has been like, you know, I, I wanna sell you this service. Uh, this, here's, all of, here's all of the benefits and features we're gonna go above and beyond. Uh, or somebody like, hey, I really wanna get this job, I will work for you. Here's my resume, here's what, all the stuff I do. The thing that, I look at is the stuff after that is the small nitty gritty details. It's like, how does this person behave with other people? Mm. How does this person follow up on an issue that I have? You know, what are this person's work ethic like versus the sales pitch? Mm. Right. So I think it almost goes without saying it's like the stuff that you worked on, the small things in your career that allow you to grow are the exact same things that I think anybody can leverage if they really want to get into the, into the, uh, you know, the next level of their career. Right. Because you can learn tactics and you can learn enough at a general level so that you know who to call in for extra help, but certain habits, those things you have to train yourself. You have to train yourself to, um, try to approach a conversation with, with, uh, a seek to understand first and then to be understood mentality. That's something you train yourself on. Right. And if you're going to become a leader, if you're going to, venture into any kind of role where you need to be collaborative with people these are skills you need to work on beforehand i like like you said i don't need to know python but we could we could build some serious applications or whatever it may be if i understand when i need to call on the subject matter expert that actually does know how to code or you know how to use google google <laughs> you know <laughs> Google should take one year off of everybody's university education just oh, because man. you can call you can call <laughs> on Google right now and find out if you're listening to this and you don't know what Python is, there should be no reason why in five minutes you can't figure it out. Uh, and one of the big reasons I'm starting this podcast is because there's almost this divide between being in a tech role versus everything else. And unless people understand that technology is not something that's separate, it's the way of life. Tech is you, everything. It's everything. For you to be in finance. For you to go training, right, in your specific example, uh, off-season training, uh, your game analysis, it's all tech-driven. Mm -hmm. If you can operate uh, an iPad and look at, you know, how to integrate your film into your own personal cloud, you can go home and evaluate your competition, mm -hmm. that's going to push you back versus somebody who understands that, right? That is a very small example in a sports, football sports-specific uh, area. But that applies everywhere. I mean, you look at someone who understands technology and accounting is going to allow them to shave off hours of work a week because they can automate stuff mm -hmm. that is repetitive versus Absolutely. somebody sitting there. I think so many people sit there just filling Excel files every single day. I'm like, man, if you spend 10 minutes on Google, you can automate that. Man, and even certain things so simple as, uh, you know, somebody fills out a form and then you have to go in and manually mine that data and bring it over to a spreadsheet. Just understanding how different applications and different technology could make your role simpler. You don't have to be an entrepreneur at all to, to get great use out of a Zapier workflow, you know, just pulling data from one place, moving it over. Technology is everywhere. And as you were saying earlier, 
uh, the companies who look to disrupt themselves rather than an outside influence coming and shaking up the whole entire industry, if you're continually looking on, all right, how can we take what we see on the horizon and put that into what we're doing now so that we're one step ahead and we're the ones who are disrupting ourselves, not somebody else. I mean, I think those are the people who are going to be most successful, no matter if we're talking about, you know, 2020 or if we're talking about 2030. That's yeah. just a, a concept that's going to be true no matter what. I think, I think if, if you know, on, on this topic, um, and it reminds me of, you know, what's happened in the past three months with, with COVID and all that, right? I think a lot of people are now displaced, right? Their jobs are, are gone. They have to reinvent themselves. Businesses are reinventing themselves, right? Talk about talk about being under pressure, and you would love to hear some sort of story or anecdote from from your football career uh, in the CFL. Like, why is it an advantage to be an underdog with your back against mm -hmm. the wall? And how I think you know it's this great I think it's a great time to be that right now because it's almost like a secret weapon being an underdog, mm -hmm. right? It's like you mm -hmm. have the power. Man, you know what? Um, it, football, as any sport, is, is a high-performance industry. That means that every day you show up, you're being graded in front of your peers. And it's a merit-based opportunity, right? You perform, you stay. If you don't, you get voted off of the island, right? So our coach used to have a saying. Um, I'm sure he took it from somewhere else. He said, the pressure is a privilege, right? People are only given pressure in situations where they're capable of rising to the occasion. If you're not capable of rising to the occasion, chances are it's an opportunity that wasn't meant for you yet. Or you just don't know what you're capable of doing because you haven't performed to this level as yet. So on a regular basis, we would, we would ramp up the pressure in our practice so that when we got to the game, the, the pressure is just a construct of the mind, right? when um, there's turbulent situations, there's roadblocks, there's people trying to tear the ball out of your hands and take your head off. Um, if you've prepared at the highest level that you can, the confidence that you get from that preparation allows you to get into tough situations and still execute. Like you said, you know, it, the execution is really what separates people. So in practice, it was as simple as when the ball goes up in the air as a defensive back, I don't let anybody else catch the ball or I catch the ball and that's the only options. Now, it. it's very simple to say. And I mean, from the outside looking in, it's like, okay, we're talking about playing catch, but let me give you some numbers to break it down. Okay, we play 18 games in the CFL, all right? Each game will have about 60, 65 plays, maybe sometimes more, maybe sometimes less. So let's just say we're looking at about 1,000 plays during the course of the season um, as a defensive player right now out of all those games there's going to be a whole ton of passes but i'd be lucky if the ball came my way to my guy maybe 10 to 20 times and of those times if i catch the ball five times out of 1000 plays i would be an all-star five interceptions wow. out of 1000 plays would make me an all-star so in practice every single time the ball is up in the air the people who knock the ball down, those are good players. The people who are able to catch that ball, they have 10-year careers. They make double the money. You know, yeah. those are the people who are re-signed first in free agency. Those are the people who live in different houses. Those are the people whose kids go to different daycare, right? When you start putting it like that, now catching that ball all of a sudden has a whole different pressure associated with it. But if you separate all those results from, like I said, every day show up and in practice, you know ball. that catching the ball is the deal, then in the game, you can catch the ball because the pressure is a privilege. Not everybody has the opportunity to change their life by just doing one thing really, really well. I think the way you broke this down is probably the best analysis I've seen outside, you know, business world and outside the business world, you know? It's, it's like these key KPIs that you have to hit mm -hmm. for you to, you know, make money, right? And what is your KPI? It's, it's catching five balls a season, right? That's exactly it. Uh, so that was, you, you put it put it amazing. I think the second thing that is so unique about what you just said is you have such a clear focus on what you need to work on every single day mm -hmm. and spend X percentage of your time 
practicing knocking down and even more than that catching the ball when thrown to you if you don't know what you're trying to achieve what the goal is in your mm -hmm. case is catching the ball you're going to do all these different things that don't drive the value to you so you can live in a different house so you can make double the money you can resign with whatever team you want and it all starts from understanding what are you going to achieve what is your goal and how are you going to get there totally right? and and it goes back to the very first thing we spoke about was when you're looking at getting to the next step in your career what are the people who already are at that next step what are they doing you may even be trailblazing and trying to do something that hasn't been done before but disruptors share common traits right these are the people who maybe they're able to balance um, an extensive workload and still manage your life. Okay, what does that look like? Maybe there are people who are able to go long periods of time with a very, very specific focus when they're doing their work. Maybe these are people who, if you're a writer, these are people who are able to publish a high volume of, of content, right? Regardless of what it is, you have to look at who are the high achievers in your field, what are they doing, and how can I model inputs, behaviors, that generally lead to the results that they're getting, right? Um, you got lead measures and lag measures. If we're talking about analytics, right? You want to look back at the things that you can control that you're doing and make sure that of the lead measures, you know, am I catching 50 balls after practice every day, right? Because I can't control necessarily if I'm going to get five interceptions in a season, but I can control, okay, on day one of practice every week, I'm going to go get, get on the jug machine and I'm gonna go through my routine, I'm gonna catch 50 balls. 50 balls each week is slowly gonna add up and that's just gonna train me so I have that confidence from preparation. When I get in a sticky situation, the ball is up in the sky, the lights are shining, 50,000 people screaming, million on TV, all that blanks out and I just go back to catching the ball, right? So finding out what's your KPI and then identifying the lead measure that's gonna allow you to best execute towards that KPI. Those are two things that are big for me. Well, this is, this is great. Oh man, this is, I'm just, I'm so excited about <laughs> how you broke it down and the numbers, man, kudos to you, buddy. Um, yeah. One thing that, you know, I think people um, that I speak to, and I'm sure you've also come across many young uh, kids who want to get into, into, you know, a scholarship, uh, want to get their MBAs and whatnot. One thing that people do is back to your point, um, they keep dwelling on stuff versus taking action. Mm. Walk me through, um, how does somebody move out of the phase of, I've prepared enough, mm -hmm. I gotta go and execute. And until you start cacking those balls in practice, you're not gonna get to where you wanna get to. You can mm -hmm. plan as much as you want, you can get the numbers as much as you want, but you gotta go, just, just do it, execute, right? You know what, um, I had a, a business mentor and one of the things that she told me, she actually told me two really good pieces of, pieces of advice that apply, you know, in all different industries. One is sometimes you just got to build the plane while you fly, which means, you know, you got to go for certain opportunities while you're still mastering the skills you need to be an expert at them. You can't necessarily just wait until you're a pro to start playing the pro game because everybody has to take their lumps. You have to lose in order to win. You have to experience certain mistakes so that you can look back, analyze what you did, and then course correct, right? Nobody at all has, has stepped up to the plate and hit home runs every single time. So you have to get into the game because the theory doesn't become solidified into, you know, veteran pro habits until you've tried it, saw what works, saw what doesn't work, and then made your own formula to success, right? So you got to build that plane while you fly it. And then another thing is, Say, say we're talking about actually launching a business. I've had many a small business myself. In college, I started a t-shirt company. And um, most recently, I have a youth football organization, a youth mentorship program. And she told me that you need to be embarrassed by your launch. Like, you should put your stuff out there before it's even ready because the social pressure of having to um, iterate and continue to improve on what you put out into the public is going to force you to make your product even better than it was or even better than it would be it's easy to sit behind a computer screen and just type away it's easy to write in a notebook 
it's more challenging to put something out there, make yourself vulnerable to be exposed, have, have a critical eye on what you're doing and get feedback from people that sometimes yeah. it might actually hurt. But um, being a little bit embarrassed by your launch is always a good thing because it's going to force you to go back to the drawing board and then really, you know, hunker down on knocking out the things that are important. You know, not everything's important. It doesn't matter yeah. if, you, if yeah. your banners on your website are a certain color. That Don't worry about that. So put it out there and then iterate as you go. Yeah, I think that becomes, to your earlier point, it becomes a pressure. Once you put something out there, the pressure's on. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are capable of making it happen, you're gonna do whatever you can in your power to go and get it, right? And that's exactly it. Put it out there, let the pressure help propel you forward, right? The other thing I think from a business perspective is, is a, it's a great, great point that you, you, you mentioned. Many people, even businesses, wait to launch products until they're ready. By that time, somebody else already launches it. It might not be perfect, but they already got feedback mm -hmm. from all the consumers on what's missing. And they already started working on iteration mm -hmm. while the other company is trying to get their presentations made nice and clean for the board to approve. Speed over perfection every time. Because what you may think is perfect in your own mind you don't have to sit down and deliberate when somebody else can come to you from the outside and point out things that you're blind to. You know, when, when we were looking at something for so long, uh, certain, certain aspects of it begin to blend in with each other. So we can't see what is what is, there's not a high contrast, high definition picture when you're staring at something for so long. So that, that outside input allows you to iterate faster and put out new versions, you know, in a shorter time frame, And ultimately in the end, um, the market will speak, right? If what you're doing is in demand, people will, will respond. And if it is not, you'll know sooner so that you can save your time, effort, and money. And at the end of the day, there's a limited amount of time. You only can give so much effort. And when the money runs out, then you're in trouble, right? So yeah, go quick. It's better to know upfront so you can iterate and change course and find something that works versus dwell on it and have regrets down the road or somebody else is going to launch the same thing that you, you said hey, that's my idea so many times i heard people say oh, i had this idea before anybody else did but too bad you didn't launch it you didn't execute <laughs> it. you've got your um your season coming up you're working hard uh but i was also on on your i know you got your side hustle courtneystephen.com um mm -hmm. you know how are you managing camps as you mentioned you know speaking you have a, a newborn baby, married, mm -hmm. pro football athlete, and you still have time to be in my podcast. How do you <laughs> manage all this stuff, man? Like, you know, man, when you put it like that, it sounds like a lot. And um, really, I think my brother gave me some good advice once upon a time. I brought him into uh, my youth football program, which is evolving into more of just all sports because I'm, I'm seeing the need for it in the community and, and how it fits. But uh, while you're doing any one thing, that's the only thing that exists, right? So whether it's, you know, 7 a.m. and I'm with my son and, um, you know, we're just eating breakfast and watching cartoons, like that's the only thing that's going on at that point in time. Um, once he goes down for a nap, if it's time for me to write on my blog, then, you know, that's, that's my deep work time for the blog, right? When it's um, early in the off season, so right after the Grey Cup, uh, November playoff time, depending on how the team does, I'll, I'll start the lead generation marketing campaign, the active marketing campaign for my camps that launch in the new year. So we run those programs January, February, March. So yeah. I have a calendar in the year for macro and micro things and just being very aware of my time, auditing how I'm spending my time so that I'm making sure that, you know, my biggest fear is I don't want to take all my potential to the grave with me, right? Like that's the number one thing that keeps me up at night. Okay. So yeah. just, just trying to make sure that two things I check on every single day is I always look at my finances every day. You know, I check my, my little app that I got that tells me, okay, how am I doing? Am I on track for what my budgets were for the month? Am I spending within the ranges that I've set for myself. And then the second thing I check every day is my calendar, right? I wanna make sure that I've allotted time for the things that are important so that, like you said, the important things get taken care of. Right? Yeah. So I have, I have family time, that's blocked. I have uh, writing time, that's blocked. 
I have certain key appointments that's blocked. And, and once you start measuring your outputs, you can see gaps and other places where there's opportunity to expand or contract. So unless you're measuring something, it's really hard to, to say if you're being efficient or not. Yeah, I think the point here, the key takeaway is um, prioritize and block things out very tactical mm -hmm. in your calendar, right? Put it in there. So you stop wasting time sitting in front of a computer thinking, what am I going to do? I have 10 things to do. When you could have done so many things, it happens with all, the best of us. I've, I've been there where I got 10 things to do and they're all on my list. I don't know where to start. I spent 30 minutes just trying to pick one of them versus blog out of time in the calendar. Just like football practice, the moment the clock hits zero, 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 you got 10 sec or 10 minutes for Indy. You go spend those 10 minutes writing your blog. 10 minutes is over. You switch do the next thing. I think when people say I don't have time, I think it's an excuse because people are not good at time management and prioritization. And the excuse right. becomes I don't have time. Right. And I mean, a theme for me this year is do less better. Yeah. Do less but do it better. So for me, a way that I do that is a uh, certain projects that I had going on that were, you know, experimental in nature, but to see how they could maybe grow certain projects that didn't grow the way I wanted them to, I cut those projects off and, and I doubled down on the things that were working. Right. So that's one thing you have to do. You have to really audit your time. And if, if something is going to waste, you have to cut back on it. Another thing is um, sometimes the best ideas come to you, after you kind of put them away. So maybe I'm going for a walk, maybe I'm actually playing with my son and I have a good idea of like, okay, maybe this is what my next blog topic should actually be about. I have three points right now on the tip of my tongue. I'm not gonna necessarily just put that to the back burner. I will pull out my phone in my notes, I will write down those notes. And the fact that I offloaded that from my conscious mind allows me to stop thinking about it and get back to focusing on what I'm doing at that moment. Right. So then when it's actually time to sit down and write, I know what I'm going to write about before I sit down. Exactly. You know? So little, little small things that you can do to make sure that it's easy to get in and out of focus. Um, it's easy to, to, to evaluate whether you're working towards a certain goal or not. Those are, those are just the, the habits. Like we talked about, those are the habits you, you got to build. You measure, you got to measure yourself daily, whether it's, if you're on a, on a weight loss program, you got to measure your weight. Otherwise what mm -hmm. you're doing is not working. If you're trying to, if it's money, you got to measure yourself. If you're trying to get promoted, you need feedback from your manager on, are you getting better or not? Right. When, when I look back, a thing on promotion, sorry. I ahead. think one thing people don't do enough is they don't keep a catalog of all the projects that they've worked on. Oh, that's another thing too, because at the end of six months or at the end of a year, when it's time for a, you know, that one-on-one -on -one with your, the person you report to, you want to be able to speak to you know, quantify what you've contributed, quantify what you've contributed to the organization. So um, now that's just another thing, like a small thing, like while you're working on it, catalog, write down what you've done, document. write down your experiences, document it, because document. bringing document. that into even your next job interview to be able to say, yes, I did this, this, and this, instead of just saying, yeah, I work in HR, I work in ops for two yeah. years. What have you built? What have you delivered? That's a huge one. Yeah, there, there's so much, there's so much potential, you know, when I speak to, to young um, folks in tech who, who are like, yeah, I want to grow, right? They're like, yeah, you know, I just, I just do uh, these three or four things. I'm like, well, well, wait a second. If you do these things, what impact has it on the company? What results has it delivered for your department? When they start breaking it down, they realize that the work they're actually doing is highly impactful. Mm -hmm. They don't know that because they have not been documenting the stuff that they've been working on or the projects and how that's contributed to the business. Right. So I think it goes back to, again, document, um, keep a journal, all the things you're doing and also understanding how is the work that you're doing contributing to the organization, right? If you're doing stuff that's not helping the organization or your own career, maybe you shouldn't be doing it. There you right? go. Hey, and, and that's, and sometimes that hurts, but you got to understand that like, there's only so much time in your life. I, I mean, I wrote a, I wrote a blog post, um, I think two weeks ago, and really it was about the reason why I had to leave a certain job that I had 
And it was an awesome job. The people I worked with were amazing. The company was, you know, aligned with the industry I wanted to be in. And this is just in the off season of football, right? Just a technology sales gig. But it didn't align with the life values that I set for myself. And so at the point in my life where I was at, um, it wasn't it wasn't filling me up the way I needed to because there's only so many hours in the day. And when you extrapolate that out, there's only so many hours in your life. So the value that you're spending or the value that you're getting from the time you spend each day, you need to think about if this was the context of your whole entire life, would you be happy with what you traded in? You spend time, you get value. If you're not giving value, you feel like you're just spinning your wheels and you spill it. You spend um, three hours, four hours on a commute, and that doesn't align with what you want to do right now with your life. Eventually, that's going to start to wear on you. Your output's going to go down. Your quality of your quality of life is going to go down, and chances are you're not going to be getting to where you want to get to in your career, anyways. So, unless you have a very measurable goal, and and you're working towards that measurable goal, you got to evaluate like, is the time I'm spending, is it adding value to someone else? Is it adding value to myself? Is it aligned with what I'm actually trying to accomplish? And then you got to make some real tough decisions. It's because yep. there's one life to live and you have to make sure that you do things that are going to be, you don't want to do things that are going to be regretted. That's, that's my big, that's my big thing. Yep. Like yep. don't do things that are going to be regretted. Don't spend time places that you don't feel like you're growing or adding value. I think, you know, if I may, it goes back again and I'll keep going back to your initial thing about execution is a lot of people that are unhappy with what they're doing. Um, either they need to align their value, they got to change their values, maybe they don't have the right values, or if you are at a place where your values do not align with the values of the organization, mm. then it's time for you to go somewhere else. Absolutely. You try to make it work because it's not going to. You cannot change it. Mm -hmm. And that's a tough existence, you know, where that's where you get into the situation where you're talking about people beating up the alarm clock every morning because they're just they're just shooting the messenger because it's time to go clock in and they don't want to clock in, right? Yeah. Ideally, we can get to a place where the skill set we've built will allow us to give greater value to the world and we can get that fulfillment back because we're living inside of, uh, you know, our optimum area of expertise. Um, I know we're coming up on time. For everyone listening, Courtney, you know, a scenario, um, I think there's a room full of people right now, um, you know, some are football fans, some of them are, um, you know, trying to work, work and working hard every day. Everyone is looking to grow uh, their tech careers, grow in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, not even tech, in a environment in the future where most of the businesses, most of the roles are actually uh, driven by digital technology. What is one message you're giving these people to make a big, powerful um, push to get max, to maximize their careers and value out of their life? What's the one thing you would tell them? I would think that the most valuable skill you could ever develop is the ability to learn new things. Once you stop growing, once you stop learning, that's when you're gonna slowly but surely become obsolete. And in a world that's ever evolving with new challenges coming up in every day, in every industry, facing people in their personal lives and in their work lives, eventually you're gonna hit a wall that you need to either grow to get over and get past, or you're gonna let that wall stop you from progressing. So if you wanna keep pushing forwards, you have to continue to learn and push yep. yourself to be somebody who you are not right now, but you can become. That's well said. You gotta, you gotta go there and, and just get it, you know? You gotta, you gotta keep growing every day. Growing every day, perfect. Um, thanks so much, Courtney. And, um, you know, just, just a quick shout out, Courtney, again, all-star, Thai cats, you know, one of, one of my favorite football players growing up, we, we did a lot of, uh, a lot of bulldog adventures, you know, still remember all the games. Um, Courtney is going to be playing this year for the Thai cats. If, if there is CFL, hopefully there is fingers crossed. Hope, hopefully. hopefully. Um, you know, big, big into, into, he's got a, a, some of the amazing uh, camps, uh, amazing speaker, motivational speaker, CourtneyStephen.com. Please check it out. Um, Courtney, such an inspiration and motivation. Thank you so much for being on the show. Yeah, I appreciate the opportunity. Um, 
love what you're doing here. And yeah, feel free to free to feel free to tap in anytime, man. I, I love to be around the energy and I love what you're doing. Team, remember to like, subscribe, and share with a friend and visit tambourbango.com for a ton of free content and exercises.